All right, so throughout the summer, I did that gigantic series where I talked about all of Stephen King's short stories that have been adapted into either a movie or some sort of TV format, but just a screen format in general. It felt like you were doing that forever. Yeah, it, yes, especially on my end. <laughs> <laughs> I know for you, it probably felt like a lifetime. And so after doing like 23 videos, the, la the one I ended on was The Miss, which is technically a novella like all these are that I'm going to be doing. But I, but I did The Miss because it was in a collection of short stories. It was the first one in Skeleton Crew, which is interesting. And uh, after 23 videos, uh, somebody's comment on The Mist was, where was Secret Window? <laughs> it was like, well, what I, what I wanted to do was do the novellas separately. Which no, 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 what like, you wanted to do was comment back and be like, "You fucking do secret window." <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, is with the, with the exception of a good marriage out of Full Darkness Stars, all of the novellas are over a hundred pages, and some of them, like the Langoliers, are over two hundred pages. Mm. So it's like they're they're not quite novels, but they're far past short stories. Um, and that's basically what I'm going to be doing. We're going to talk about um, the three in different seasons, obviously, we're going to start with. Mm -hmm. This book's in very bad shape, and I, I got it from you. <laughs> I don't even remember having it. I probably <laughs> bought it at, like, a yard sale or something. That's what it looks like. Yeah. Um, but then we're also going to do, or I'm going to do, me and you are going to bookend it. You're going to do the first one with me and the last one with me, and I'm going to do all the ones in between, just the way I did the other ones. Um, but we're also going to touch on Full Darkness Stars, Hearts in Atlantis, and yes, Secret Window in Four Past Midnight. The Langoliers is in here also. So. Do you own all those books you just showed? Uh, two of them are from the library. I have a copy of Four Past Midnight. It's the one with the Secret Window cover, but I can't find it. <laughs> oh, that sucks. Yeah, I got this copy of Hearts in Atlantis for only like five dollars online, and I couldn't believe it. That's nice. It's that in really like great shape, condition. Too. Yeah, it's in really great condition. So nice. Obviously, I wanted to start this with um, probably the biggest movie to come out of a uh, sort of Stephen King novel. It's it's one of the ones he's most proud of to the point that. He was doing like I think a thousand dollars for the rights to his stories to adapt into a movie, mm -hmm. and when he got the a thousand dollar check for the rights to Shawshank, he framed it and sent it to Frank Darabont with a note that said, "In case you need bail money." Hmm. And it was like, and it's it's really interesting when you see what uh, like when he at the, at the beginning and end when he talks about his methods uh, in different seasons. Mm -hmm. He's mainly talking about the uh, the adaptation into Stand By Me because Shawshank hadn't happened yet. Yeah, it was, it, it was so weird to see him speaking from a pre Shawshank the movie world, given how much of an impact the movie has made. <laughs> yeah, which so, is so uh, funny because you would never, if you were just if if Shawshank was just coming into your life, you would never peg it as a Stephen King project because there is nothing supernatural or creepy about it at all yeah and I, and I like that you bring that up because one of the things I really wanted to mention that I did a lot in the other series also was that King is one of the most would you, he's got to be like right up there with the most popular authors of all time easily I, but, I think you could make that argument yeah but the thing is is like to the point that it's almost absurd to even make that argument because it's so yeah. awful but I still think he's incredibly underrated with what exactly he can do because he's mainly known for being like the horror monster type author. And that's just the way people see him when they hear his name. Mm -hmm. But there are so many, his writing, even that kind of stuff has so many profound moments and layers in it that when you, when you see those layers and even his horror stories, it's no surprise at all he could come up with a story like this or The Body or The Green Mile or any of the other ones that aren't considered horror. I and, forgot uh, The Green Mile was his. Yeah, and Hearts in Atlantis, the book, is like really 
like touching in this really profound way to where it just really brings out these personal experiences that you can relate to in, in, in regardless of what genre he happens to be doing. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, and I actually think he doesn't get enough credit for Shawshank because a lot of people, there's a lot of people that will tell you Shawshank is the greatest movie of all time. Mm -hmm. and there are a ton of people that will tell you that and mean it sincerely. And the adaptation is pretty straightforward. Yeah. But at the same time, there is a lot of, like, because it is a novella that's just a little over 100 pages and the movie is an epic, it's actually this weird reversal of instead of the novel or the book feeling like an extended version of the movie because usually movies have to take out a lot. Mm -hmm. It's actually the movie is an extended version of the story where the movie got to put more into it while basically keeping... Like, I don't recall many things, if anything at all, in the novella that aren't in the movie. The only one I know is that uh, Red isn't black in the book. And when he says yeah. maybe it's because I'm Irish, where in the in the book that's really his response, and in the movie it's treated like a joke. It's it's a funny joke the way Morgan Freeman delivers it. Yeah, M movies are always taking red hair out of the equation. Like, isn't McMurphy also supposed to be a redhead in Cuckoo's Nest? Yeah, and now that I think about it, how many redheaded actors do you know? Like male redheaded actors. I could think of two, and one technically really isn't even an actor. He's just acted in things, and you're going to be like, what the hell? The only two I could think of are Rupert Grant and Seamus. <laughs> For some reason, the first one that came to mind was Damian Lewis. But oh, I forgot about Damian Lewis. Who was in Dreamcatcher, so he's relevant. <laughs> yeah. So, um... What is it about Shawshank that really, really stands out to you, and do you think it deserves being considered one of the greatest movies of all time? I don't know. I feel like it's just a perfect storm of, of really good things. You have characters that you can invest in who most of them are extremely likable, and the ones that aren't likable aren't likable for the reasons you want them to not be likable. Um, there's a lot of elements at play, you know, friendship, the fact that we even play with the idea a little bit that Andy might not have done what he thought he did. And then, you know, all, it's a nicely shot movie too. Like yeah. it's, huh? That, that would be Roger Deakins. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. Like, like Roger Deakins would ever disappoint. Um that and it's got and the acting and it's great i mean i know morgan freeman's the only nomination but everybody in there was worthy especially tim robbins yeah and i would have been i would have been very comfortable in a world where james Woodmore had been nominated but who would have been uh james Woodmore. he played brooks oh yeah yeah that and it's got you know my recent obsession lately the score the score is fantastic that would be and it, and it just flows with the story so well yeah it's like before, before people were really before like mainstream audiences were drawing attention to them the way they do now mm -hmm. it's like the giants involved in this movie with deacons doing the cinematography and newman doing the score mm -hmm. it's like and they, they're basically becoming like regular names in regards to like normal people discussing movies because they've, they've reached such a level at this point mm -hmm. and I, I, I what i do want to mention what you brought up about how the characters are likable mm -hmm. how much of a miracle is that the most comforting character in the movie that is giving us the narration is somebody who is straight up saying yeah you know i committed murder yeah <laughs> well it's funny you get invested with all these characters and the movie tells you at the very beginning this is where the worst of the worst go yeah and I, and I also love the idea how they play on that Red's the only one that straight up says that he actually did it mm -hmm. so we never it's, it's almost like this neutral ground to put us on that makes it easier to fall in with the characters as we do that we even Andy we don't really know 100% who's guilty and who isn't. Mm -hmm. 
Like Brooks, Brooks has a backstory where he killed his wife and daughter, but even then, it's kind of vague. Yeah. And it's that, also funny that with Andy, like we're following Andy from the beginning, but it takes us a while before we really learn anything about him. Yeah, it's like he's there's a, there's a continuous thing because in the novella is seen through the perspective of Red, like the narration of the movie. Yeah. And it's him like writing all of this down mm -hmm. and telling it to us as he sees it. And there's the whole thing where he comes to like this epiphany at the end where he's like, I'm a supporting character in my own story because Andy is this mythical figure mm -hmm. that just everything surrounds him. Mm -hmm. but it, it, to the point that you keep forgetting, it really is Red's story because we get so involved in that mystery of Andy, we forget that there's so little we know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that but that myth mythical quality is so strong and pulls us in that we just automatically go along with it that Andy's the hero, but we see nothing from his perspective. Mm -hmm. and that's like, too, you know, we, Andy's our character that we're following and it's his story, but we spent, there's only a couple scenes without Red. We spend the movie with Red. When Andy goes away, we don't follow Andy on his adventure of how he got to Mexico. We stay with Red. There's another more subtle instance of that I noticed, which was um, when they get the letter from Brooks after mm -hmm. he's after he's died. Yeah, and it's this kind of emotional moment for all the characters there because they were all close to him. Mm -hmm. It's Andy that's reading the letter, and the camera moves away from Andy to just linger on Red. Yeah, while Andy is still reading. Mm -hmm. That's like that, that stuff like that shows you whose story it actually is. Mm -hmm. And there's um, what else was I going to mention? Uh, what do you think about the pacing for a movie that's known for being like? Because I mean, it's it feels epic and it's known for being long, but in the grand scheme of things, the runtime doesn't feel that like two hours and twenty two minutes really isn't that long compared to to a lot of movies especially recently mm -hmm. but it still but it still feels it feels epic but it like goes so fast every time you see it it keeps moving like there's not really any point that nothing that happens in the movie is pointless yeah everything i can't think of one scene that i look at that and go oh we could have cut that yeah and, and even then when you get to the end it's like even stuff that might have seemed pointless. There is so much seed planting in this movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're doing it the whole time. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, which is, and it's, they do so much seed planting. Have you ever noticed them, Warden Norton finding the hole in the wall? There's still like half an hour left. Mm -hmm. The entire last half an hour of the movie is revealed. <laughs> yeah and that that's crazy me in itself but there's also something to note which that, which we do from red's perspective yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. well i didn't know this but what made perfect sense to me when i heard it was because uh, it might sound weird at first but apparently darabont watched goodfellas a lot mm -hmm. when preparing for this and it's like it's because he used it to go he he used it as a sort of like point of reach of narration and the passage of time mm -hmm. where it's like th this movie will just be happening and then suddenly they'll just casually say in dialogue oh, by the way six years have passed or eight years have passed mm -hmm. and it just flows so nicely but yet somehow even though that's really the only way we see the passage of time and the movie feels fast you can still feel the weight of the years somehow it's like so much happens, so much happens in it, but yet it's all moved so quickly. It only registers when we realize how much time has actually passed. Yeah. Which has got to be an extremely difficult thing to pull off. I'm, I'm not entirely sure how one even attempts to pull that off. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it, it is a miracle that it was pulled off because, I mean, <laughs> This is the thing where it very easily could have been the end game five years later. Yeah. But it's used, like, the passage of time contributes to the story. Like, like it's important to the story that it took six years for Andy to get his library. 
it's important, you know, it's important to the story when the time passes. Yeah, because that's the thing where you were also talking about, um, even, even if there's a scene that maybe doesn't seem like, as far as like the pointless scenes, there's also the whole idea of just building the characters mm -hmm. and our relationship with them. Like, um, like the scene where Haywood is looking for a rock and he finds one and it's a, it ends up being horse shit. Yeah. And it's like, even stuff like that, it still just gives us the relationship with those characters. Mm -hmm. And it's all working, and it's all just working as this big, giant, like, machine almost, with just these perfect parts, all working in the right ways to build this whole thing. Because if you didn't feel that way, if you didn't feel the camaraderie between them. Which is, it's really a miracle for, either. it's a miracle for Haywood that we get to that point, because Remember, the first time we met Haywood, he made fun of a guy so bad and pushed him to the breaking point that he was literally beaten to death. Yeah. There's, like, there's those moments where you can actually see why these people are here, but then there's also cases like, I love, I really, really love how conflicting of a character Hadley is. Mm -hmm. Because we set him up, as, because in the novella, he's not he's not introduced until the roof scene mm. there is no build up to him at all until the roof scene which mm -hmm. i love that the movie built up how much of a risk it was for andy to approach him with the idea yeah now that we've, now that we've seen him beat the dude to death and we see hadley as this totally monstrous scary and soulless character mm -hmm. and then everything after andy makes that proposition to him there's like a humanity like we know we hear about his family he gets them the beer he has a beer with them technically yeah and then he takes boggs out of the equation in the most brutal way possible and when we when boggs goes into his cell and we see hadley standing there mm -hmm. we love hadley in that moment mm -hmm. because it's taking boggs out of the equation yeah, but then in about a half hour, we're going to hate him all over again for taking Tommy out. Yeah, which almost, which seems to, like, we kind of come back around when it's like, um, when he's playing the record and Hallie's on the door saying, you know, I'm coming in for you. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is basically just Hadley doing what he has to do. Sort of like when they um, searched the cell. Mm -hmm. But then when he he's the one that pulls the trigger on Tommy, it's like a whole because I mean Norton makes this uh, comment offhand about how it broke Hadley's heart to do that, mm -hmm. but I feel like that was more of a uh, Norton just wanted to bring up. Oh, by the way, we shot him. Yeah, <laughs> and so I love that back and forth with that, and then it's satisfying. Like even though we had that moment where we love seeing him in Boggs' cell, it's still satisfying when it comes back around and we hear that Hadley sobbed when he was arrested. Yeah. It's like, it's one of the, one of the best examples I can think of of a conflicting character for an audience. Mm -hmm. And major props to Clancy Brown, by the way, for pulling that off. <laughs> On top yeah. of the character development in itself. Yeah, Clancy Brown's really good in this too. Yeah, it's like every... Like so, sometimes it's like I mean the performance is great all around, but just in in almost kind of a joking fashion. I don't mean this too much. Uh, it almost takes away when every now and then when he really really raises his voice, you can kind of hear the Mister Krabs coming in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean he kind of showed a Mister Krabs character trait with that money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that How that planted the Mister Krabs seeds. How did that never occur to me until now? <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm surprised no one has made, like, a little video compilation of, like, Hadley saying something relating to money with Mr. Krabs when talking to Andy. <laughs> oh, shit. While we're on the subject, um, very interesting on the movie's part. Um, they don't kill Tommy in the book. They, they transfer him to a better prison and, like, bribe him. Oh, just not do anything. It's like a, I, I. That's the thing is I like the way that like everything that happens in the book works really well within the book. But when I see the changes the movie made, it makes me appreciate the movie even more. Mm -hmm. To make those changes that all 
work and coming together in their different way. Like the whole, um, the whole aftermath with Brooks, like with, as far as Brooks goes, where we see him leave in the novel, it just leaves him with, uh, Brooks left in tears because he didn't want to leave. Mm -hmm. And that's the last we hear. And it's like for the movie to take the whole Brooks aftermath, like that scene in itself is just iconic. And one of the most heartbreaking, like string of scenes in movie history. Mm -hmm. And that not only are they able to make a truly iconic moment out of that, but it serves the story so much better also by adding that because it's perfect to bring back to the epilogue with Red to where it shows this is what Red could be when he gets out versus going to find Andy and Sid. Mm -hmm. And it's like to be able to add all of that into a story that's already great is incredible. It's an like it's incredible as far as adaptations go. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Darabont was the one himself that adapted it, so all props go to him for that. So, um, what do you think about the warden as a character? I think he's he's the really good corrupt villain. I mean, you have so many reasons to hate him. At first, you don't really, because when you first meet him, all he says really is the same generic stuff that anybody would say to prisoners, except for the whole, his, I can't think of the word, affinity for the Bible. Yeah. And it's just, and it's funny, and, well, it's not funny while it's happening, but when you think back on it, it's funny that this guy that was so, like, you're going to read your Bible every day, and talks about salvation, and the dude just keeps doing unethical shit and just breaking the law repeatedly throughout the rest of the movie. And he hides all of his spoils behind a fucking Bible verse. It's like, it's, I've always kind of associated it, and maybe I'm thinking too deeply into it. I've always associated it with, on the surface, he's this God-following Christian. And when you open, when you pull that picture away, you're taking the skin away, and underneath, he's just a corrupt, money-hungry bastard. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it was intended that way, but that's how I take it. I could, I, I've never heard that, but I could totally see that being. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and it is one of those cases where it's like, you can tell he's just one of those characters where. I said, this is, this is another case I'm trying to avoid saying potentially controversial things. Mm -hmm. like as, as if to say that this is a not-so-uncommon thing and not just in fiction. Mm -hmm. But the idea, basically, it's almost like he feels like he can do and get away with anything, not just necessarily just because of his position, but because he's hiding behind the Bible in that sense of, as long as I, you know, seem to follow the Bible, all sins are off my hands. Yeah. So he doesn't give a shit about any of the corrupt stuff he does as long as it gets him money and anything else. So he can get that million dollar retirement or whatever it was he was looking for. Mm -hmm. Also, we're done. He wasn't quite as prominent in the novella either because they start off with one warden and then he actually becomes the warden about halfway through. Mm. And they switch out and then uh, the whole epilogue with him uh, plugging himself isn't in the novella. Hmm. Which is also a perfect moment that is like the. There's just so much perfect comeuppance to him to see that he was outsmarted, to see the whole um, the the Bible first that's in front of the safe, basically calling him out himself, and then basically just being caught and everything. Mm -hmm. Red's line about how I wonder if the last thing went through his mind, aside from the bullet, was how did Amy Frank do this to me? Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing, too. There's so much amazing dialogue in this. Yeah. A lot of it's and in the... Also, a what I also like, you were talking about the comeuppance. I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'll let you go on to the dialogue, but a lot of movies, the comeuppance can feel really cheesy, but in this, like, anybody that gets their comeuppance, it feels justified. Yeah, I, I was going to bring that up with the score, and then I forgot to. Hmm. That's basically what this movie does, and I wonder if that's why this movie is so universal, is a lot of people like to complain that movies that people might seem, like, inspiring or have, like, a really big happy ending and all that might come off as cheesy or overbearing and stuff like that. And the score is usually the first culprit in this. Mm -hmm. 
but like this movie reaches so many big enormous emotions but never like overplays itself Mm -hmm. whether it be the comeuppance or Newman score and all that stuff like it all feels earned in its way which I think makes it so satisfying to just about anybody that's probably seen it yeah you were talking about the dialogue uh, that's real. Like I said, a lot of it comes from the novella, and a lot of it's new. Um, there's a lot of stuff like, like the line. I have heard quite a bit that the line "get busy living or get busy dying" mm-hmm. has saved like a lot of people that feel basically stuck in their life, mm-hmm. and like that's basically the line that they live by, and it keeps them going. Yeah, and that's another thing also where it's like, um, like I often feel stuck in place uh in my own life and this whole thing of like i'm gonna be 30 in less than two months and i'm still doing the writing thing and all that and still trying to get into movies and all that it's like there are so many times where it's like what's even the point (laughs) Mm -hmm. like it's literally an impossible feat um but then that line just puts it right out there you're only doing one of two things you're either doing or you're not Mm -hmm. (laughs) And you're either getting closer to living the best life you possibly can or just inching closer to death because we're doing that already regardless. And it just, the fact that it takes one line of dialogue to sum up that whole outlook. It's like the 90s version of do or do not, there is no try. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Like the generation before them had do or do not, there is no try. The next generation got get busy living or get busy dying. Yeah. I don't know what the generation after that has. <laughs> well, like like Shawshank, maybe we'll find out late. Because obviously one of the things that comes up a lot with Shawshank is the fact that it didn't quite have this following when it first came out. Mm-mm. Like it did terribly at the box office. They, they blamed the title a lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like even though it's one of the most beloved movies of all time, there are still people that will tell you it's still kind of a shitty title. Mm-hmm. Um, and they they had to change the title of the novella from Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption because all the producers that they took the script to thought it was a Rita Hayworth biopic. Yeah. <laughs> so like, okay, we'll just keep Shawshank Redemption. And then even that was like, what does that even mean to somebody that sees that title without knowing what it is? Mm-hmm. Um, but then as soon as it hit, like, video, what else could you call it? Yeah, I I don't know. Like, that's the thing too. Is it's like. I feel like any other title this movie could have would be something really cheesy. Yeah. But as we were just saying, this movie's full strength is avoiding cheesy while being extremely powerful and emotional, mm-hmm. which are usually things that go hand in hand, unfortunately. But there's also, um, like, there's, there's the great line I love when Henry goes, or Henry, who the fuck is Henry? When <laughs> Andy. <laughs> when. When Andy goes <laughs> through his whole thing about the plot uh, with the warden and the fake identity and all that. Mm-hmm. And it's like, this is a whole really clever scheme we've built up. And it's like, the whole thing is building up like, oh man, this planet, oh my God, Andy is a genius. Oh my God, this is crazy. And then all that build up for one line of dialogue, for one final payoff of, I had to come to prison to be a boy. Yeah. And it's like sometimes one line of dialogue is just the perfect punctuation to an already great moment. And this movie is like filled with moments like that. And not to mention the whole time he's telling that story, he is planting one giant seed for later. Yeah, like I said, there's just seeds everywhere. But I, I am ashamed of myself for how long it took me to go, oh, huh when Andy's telling him this, like at that point in time when it looks like Andy's finally losing it. Mm -hmm. And Red's basically under the impression he might commit suicide. Yeah. And Red just very offhand says uh, that plane is a shitty pipe dream. Hmm. It's like, it's it's almost too obvious when you're watching it again, but that line just goes right by if you don't know where it's going. (laughs) I I wouldn't have thought any more about it until you just mentioned it. Okay, so I'm not alone. Yeah. (laughs) But now, isn't it, it's almost absurd how obvious it is. Yeah. 
that plan is just a shitty pipe dream. It's literally, they're telling us the movie. They're doing an Edgar Wright. They are just telling us the movie <laughs> mm-hmm. and getting away with it. <laughs> oh my God, could you imagine the Shawshank Redemption done by Edgar Wright? It would be, that would be just a different movie entirely. <laughs> yeah. I feel like it would keep the same dialogue, but it would deliver it like snappily. But the way it's delivered okay. here is is perfect for the environment. That, that's the great thing. The fact that this movie this movie feels anything but snappy is what makes it work so well. Mm-hmm. Like if because it, it feels so lived in, and like I said, that's how we end up feeling uh, those years go by, even though the movie itself feels like it moves along perfectly. Like even the moments when. Um, like the whole thing going on with the sisters, Mm -hmm. like the way it doesn't necessarily linger on Andy's pain from that. It's just like, all they have to say is that's how his first two years went. And that's enough to make us go, good God. And we just already feel it. (laughs) Yeah. And we just get shots of him every now and then just looking beat to shit. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it's like the power that you can do with that by not overplaying everything is how this movie works so well and how two hours and 22 minutes can feel as short as it does. Yet so, mm-hmm. like, yet there's so much weight to it. So, what do you, have we reached this point already? Hmm. The next thing I wanted to, uh, the next thing I think I was going to bring up was how you feel about the ending. Well, obviously, before we go there, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about, uh, the scenes with Red finding Andy again, but let's go back. Mm -hmm. And how I talked about how there's so much, a big chunk of this movie is the reveal. Yeah. Do you still feel this extremely triumphant feeling that almost still feels new every time you get to the scene where Norton throws the rock and it goes through the Go Watch poster, and we hear the clatter. And we don't see what happened, just everybody looks in that direction. Mm-hmm. And then Norton's hand goes entirely through the poster, and he rips the poster out. Mm-hmm. You get that same triumphant feeling every single time you see this movie. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the fact that you know the reveal is coming, and like every time we see every layer pulled back, and everything Andy did and went through, even going through the thing of switching the shoes out just to say fuck you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's like, and I feel like we've both seen this movie a lot, many mm-hmm. times. We haven't mentioned yet, um, just last year, last September, and we got to see it in a theater, mm-hmm. which was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, that's, I feel like that's where the really great movies come in is the fact that your feelings towards those moments never lessen. And sometimes they get, it's almost even better every time. Because you know? mm-hmm. there are movies where, you know, the, like a lot of movies like this that have one big reveal only really have like the one time thing where it's like, once you go back to it and you know everything that's going on, but I almost feel like it's because you can feel the weight of the years and all that. That's why it works so well is being able to know Andy's plan is happening very, very, very slowly through the whole movie. It's always going to be a big payoff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's, it's, it's crazy to me that that never loses its feeling. Um, Oh, there was there was something else I was going to mention uh, that I looked overlooked. Was there anything else you wanted to mention before we get to like the end thing? We were talking about how every scene matters. Even the fact that there just happens to be a thunderstorm that night even plays a factor. <laughs> and for like waiting for each like thunderclap, like Andy's the most fucking patient person in the world. Yeah, that's that's another one of those mythical qualities. It's like it's insane that it's. But what's crazy about this also is how grounded the movie feels. None of it feels like too much. Like none of it. None of. Does anything about it feel unbelievable to you? 
No, not really. I, guess, I think the only argument somebody could make is the miracle that nobody ever pulled his poster from. Mm -hmm. That's about as close to unbelievable as it gets. Well, no, I got one for you. It's the same one that everybody brings up. Once he went through the tunnel, how in the world was the poster back to where it was supposed to be? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because you would say maybe he had, maybe there was somebody on the inside he could have to it, but I feel like if Red didn't know about this plan, nobody knew about this plan. Well, I see, I was thinking about that the last time I watched the movie, and I think that is twofold. I think he knew that if Red knew about the plan and the guards had a feeling that he really knew, they would have beat him to death trying to get it out of him. Yeah. So it was safer for everybody to not know. And we, and we know for a fact, when you say beaten to death, that is not an exaggeration. If anything, it would have been commonplace. Yeah. <laughs> Another thing I wanted to bring up was... Um, the whole thing about, we talked about how we never know 100% if Andy is innocent or guilty. Mm -hmm. But we do have this plot thread with Tommy where we have the prisoner that basically confesses to him that he did do it. Mm -hmm. But then there's that, but once again, we never see anything through Andy's perspective, so we still never know for sure. And Norton even brings up this whole thing of, well, he's really taken to Andy, maybe he just doesn't make him feel better. And it's like, well, that's never confirmed or denied by the movie, so. Mm -hmm. um, but this scene, I really love where we see Blatch in the cell telling the story. And I love the way this, and it does almost make it seem like this almost like higher like reality to the point that maybe it is a fabricated story in a way where Blatch is telling this story and he looks like a normal person. But then as the camera gets closer to him and he starts to describe the murders, his face takes on the form of a deranged person. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, like something out of a horror movie. And so it's like that almost feels like it has this sort of heightened reality to it that maybe it is a story in a way. But... Um, but either, I love that scene regardless, no matter what it means, or whatever you can, meaning you can take it as. Mm -hmm. um, just by the way it's shot like that and the way that actor performed it. So um, does, that, does that pretty much take us to the ending? Because I got a big question about the ending. No, I think so. All right, so we've got two different endings here. We've got the novella's ending and we've got the movie's ending. And Darabont wanted the novella's ending. The studio wanted the ending that we see. Mm -hmm. The novella's ending is, what's, in what's interesting, and another great scene that the movie added was uh, how I said that the novella's from the perspective of Red, he's like writing down everything. Mm -hmm. When he gets paroled, it goes into, the story basically ends with him saying, and well, I, I hope Andy's out there doing what he's supposed to do, and I'm still in here in Shawshank, and that's just the way it is. And the, the story basically ends, and then there's a line, and then it starts up again, and he says, well, I never thought I'd be writing in this again, but now I'm writing from Hotel Room. Hmm. And it's just, and now he's out. So first off, I love the scene when Red finally gets paroled. I'm pretty sure it's the scene that solidified his Oscar nomination, for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then we have the whole, and then the novella's ending goes from, he figures it out, and then he's like, you know, he basically still ends on, I, I really hope, you know, Andy's out there. If I go out there and look for him, I hope I find him, and it just ends. Mm -hmm. Darabont wanted to end it on Red in, on the bus. Mm -hmm. Which is, which would have been perfectly fine. It would have been really, a really good ending. And of course, it's pretty much programmed in people's minds to say what the studio wanted is going to be shittier than what the director wanted. Mm -hmm. That's not always the case. So, and I can, there's a compromise here that I can get, which is 
Darabont said, if we're going to do the beach ending where they hug on the beach, it's got to be pulling away from a distance, mm -hmm. which is a perfect ending shot. Yeah, and it's a good compromise. Yeah, especially because I do love seeing them meet again. I do feel like it's this whole final level of payoff that we need. Yeah, that's, I feel like I feel like with what the movie puts you through emotionally, the movie kind of owes you that. Yes, yeah, so like I definitely get the ambiguous ending, mm -hmm. and it would have made a very good ending. But I feel like it is it is way too satisfying to see them find each other. Yeah, like I said, I, I'm guessing the studio wanted some like full on embrace. Maybe they exchanged dialogue and about how much they missed each other or something. That I can understand not wanting to do. Like, it, it worked out perfectly that we were able to combine these two visions of they meet up again, but that's all we need to know, is that they did meet up again. No dialogue or anything like that or anything overly emotional, like I said. It's stuff the movie's been avoiding the whole time, and it did right up until the very last show. Mm -hmm. so Plus, I, I mean, I don't even know what you could write to have those two say to each other after all that. Like, nothing that you write's going to be good enough. So it's best to just leave it to the imagination. It would it would have had to have been another moment, like um, I had to come to prison to be a crook or get busy living or get busy dying. It would have just had to have been one line. Yeah. Um, but but the way it is as is, I think could not be more perfect. Mm -mm. So the only thing that I could think of that would be anywhere appropriate if they felt the need to put dialogue in there is I could see, you know, Red coming up to Andy and Red just looks at Andy and says, I made the decision to keep busy living. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. Which, of, which of course, probably would have been heavily criticized for being on the nose because literally what we're seeing is Red getting busy living. <laughs> yeah, the dialogue is not needed. That's what it's, I'm saying. You could have come up with something appropriate like that and it still would have felt not satisfying. Yeah, there's not, there's not, I feel like there's not much tact in putting it this way, given how much we grew for that character, grew to love that character, but it's like, it's literally saying Red could have been the end of this movie or Bruce. Yeah. That's, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's it. It all adds up so well. It's so hard to believe the Brooks aftermath is not from the original story. Because it plays such a crucial part on top of being a great scene by itself. Mm -hmm. And I like how instead of being told about it, we watch it happen so that way we can watch and think Red's going to go down that same path. Yeah, and I, and I love that it's through his own narration as well. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, yeah, so like I was, so I guess to uh, wrap up the novella portion, it is like it's an amazing story on its own, and does reach like the whole thing about reading about when you get to those final reveals. It's all that satisfying, but the stuff that they added to the movie is like I said, it's really a perfect example of taking an already great story and just taking it to levels beyond of which I don't even know if King could have seen. Mm -hmm. Which I, I'm, I'm sure King has himself said a variation of that sentiment. So. <laughs> and I know how you're going to feel about this statement. And I'm sorry to have to make it, but I've seen all three of the big guns from 1994 over and over again. This was the best movie of 1994. <laughs> I've got two of them right behind me. You can see Shawshank's kind of, Freeman's kind of peeking over my shoulder there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, 1994 was a hell of a year for movies. I mean, you had, you know, Forrest Gump, Pulp Fiction, Four Weddings and a Funeral, The Lion King. This was the best movie that came out in 1994. And that, this is coming from somebody that grew up on Forrest and has watched you have an obsession with Pulp Fiction. I still think Shawshank is the best movie of 1994. Worth noting, uh, in case people don't know, with Four Weddings and a Funeral, you were talking about uh, one of its fellow, one of their fe fellow picture nominees, best picture mm -hmm. nominees. Because I feel like if people don't know that, people are going to be like, why the hell did he name drop Four Weddings and a Funeral there? 
because Four Weddings and a Funeral and Quiz Show were the Best Picture nominees, along with Forrest Gump, Paul Fiction, and Sean Mm-hmm. And Simon Gallo and Bob Gunton took their losses personally by going out next year and fighting Ace Ventura. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we – oh, the, the, la- the Sword in the Stone video was like this, too. Why are, how are so many connections being made? <laughs> All right, so um, this is probably going to go out like on or around the 1st of September, and I'm probably just going to go in order on different scenes. So the next one will be After People, then after that will be Stand By Me. Then we'll go on to, I think I'll do Good Hearts in Atlantis, and then when October comes around, I'm going to do one a week. Mm-hmm. When October comes around, I'll do um, Full Dark No Stars, Four Pass of mm-hmm. So, yeah, and then we're going we're gonna to end on the Secret Way. So I'm going to do the rest myself, and then me and you are going to reunite for Secret Life. Mm-hmm. So, and of course, we'll be doing uh, other videos in between as well. The verses we, were. Uh, should we tell them about the verses we're about to do? Because I feel like you're going to be extra amped for it. It should, it should probably already be out by the time this video goes out. Ah. So they already know what amazing thing happened. <laughs> <laughs> So we haven't shot that yet, so hopefully that video turned out well <laughs> as we say this. Yeah. Well, I know for you, at least half of it will. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I think that's going to be um, our Shawshank video. Is there, anything, is there anything else? Not really. Where do you put Shawshank? Because I know it's not in your top 15. It wasn't in mine either, but I might have to rethink that now that I've seen it a couple more times. Where do you what what is your honest opinion of where do you put it? Well, I love it a lot. <laughs> and I love it just as not just as much, if not more. It never ever ever lessens on the rewatch. Mm-hmm. So the thing is is I do love it now, but the thing I really wonder is what I'll feel about it in ten years. Mm-hmm. Like how <laughs> Because <laughs> it's only going to get, it's going to age this well forever. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, we're already, what, 26 years in? Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really hard to say. Do you, think, hard, but... do you think it warrants discussion as one of the greatest movies ever made? Yeah. Like, I really have no... You, you answered that so quickly. Usually you think about those questions longer. Yeah, it, it is one of those cases, though, where it's like it does feel like... Like, if somebody, came, if somebody came to you and said that Shawshank was the greatest movie ever made, you wouldn't have a glaring argument for them? Not really. Like, it's a really... <laughs> like I said, a lot of people believe it, and it's like it's... Because it's another one of those things where I think Ebert was talking about this when he put it on his great when one of his great movies was which was mm-hmm. um and it, and it made like it's a feeling that i had a lot as like a, a like in my teenage years and i was looking at the more important movies in movie history mm-hmm. and ebert like so many cases ebert was able to put a feeling into words that i've been looking for for years which was a lot of the times when you hear about a truly great movie Mm-hmm. you almost kind of get this exhausted feeling in you like it's not something you immediately want to rush out to because when you feel like you, you feel like when you hear of a great movie it sounds like work mm-hmm. like you, you, you get what I mean by that right or you get what he means by that right like you like you watched Citizen Kane for the first time recently is that kind of how you felt going into Citizen Kane yeah yeah, because there's this expectation that it's such a uh, a big movie that, like, you have to, like, you almost have to wonder, like, I called you after I watched this and came, and I was like, I kind of danced around a little bit, but I was like, I don't really understand all the hype. Yeah, and I think another thing he means by work is that it feels like there's a lot where you, like, you have to trudge through. Mm-hmm. to get to a payoff mm-hmm. but it's like 
the scenes in this movie, one after the other after the other, are so great. And it's, I feel the same way about The Godfather also. Like, some people think The Godfather can be a bit of a drug, but they understand why it's one of the greatest. Mm -hmm. But I think The Godfather is the same way. I just feel like scene after scene after scene just works so well. And there's so many different payoffs throughout. Um, that that's really where it gets you. To be able to just go like that and always keep your interest no matter what mm -hmm. and have these big scenes that just work on their own is like, yeah. Like like I talk about the Brooks scene. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> it's obviously, I'll, I'll just, I, I keep coming back to this, I'll just come out and say it. The Brooks scene is one of the best scenes in movie history, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> And so it's like that, the power of that one scene would be the most power like one entire movie has in a lot of different cases. The Brooks scene is just one scene in this movie of massive payoffs. Mm -hmm. To talk about the Brooks scene by itself is to completely go over the fact that the entire last half an hour of this movie is a powerhouse that never fades. <laughs> and all those different moments like I said even just a line of dialogue is its own big powerful moment um, where if you just bottled it just one line and the way it's delivered and what the line is you can just bottle a little bit and then that's enough to fuel one entire movie that kind of power <laughs> mm -hmm. and this movie is just full of those for almost two and a half hours <laughs> It's, yeah, so I have no problems with people saying they think this is the greatest thing ever. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anything else for you? No, I think that's it. All right, then I guess until we go on to the next uh, collection, uh, I think that's going to be it.